Ah, you got it working. Awesome. <laughs> I think you're muted. Uh, Thank uh, you so much. So great. I got the recording to work. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Safe. And um, just to back up for the sake of the recording, welcome to our professional development session on summer undergraduate research opportunities in neuroscience. And we are introducing our panelists right now. So Allison, you're next on my screen, if you could introduce yourself. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm Allison. I am originally from New York, um, but I went to Muhlenberg College, which is a small liberal arts school in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, and there I earned my bachelor's in neuroscience and I graduated two years ago in 2020. Um, and while I was an undergrad, I did two summers of research, um, one after my sophomore year at my college and then um, the summer after my junior year as part of a summer research program at another institution. Um, so I'm happy to provide perspective on both, you know, opportunities at your home institution and as well as external programs. Um, I'm a current post -bac at the NIH. Um, like I said, I've been there for about two years now after graduating. Um, and this fall, I'll be starting my PhD in neuroscience. Great, congrats on that. Thank you. So you're next on my screen. Great, thanks. Hi, my name is Teresa Reyes. Um, I work at the University of Cincinnati. I'm a professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Systems Physiology. Uh, I'm a behavioral neuroscientist. I'm currently a co-director of a summer undergraduate research program. Um, our program is funded by a grant from NINDS and is specifically directed to increase um, opportunities for um, disadvantaged and underrepresented students. Um, and I also run a research lab and have had um, summer undergraduates in my lab uh, for probably the past 20 years. So happy to talk from the perspective of a program director and as a PI. Great, thanks again for being here. Grace, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Grace. I'm originally from California, but I go to school at Vanderbilt in Tennessee. I'm a junior right now studying neuroscience and Spanish, and I've had my fair share of research opportunities starting in high school. I've worked as an assistant in general biology labs, and then once I got to Vanderbilt, um, I have been involved in an addiction research lab where I study nicotine dependence. And I have also done um, a summer program at the Mayo Clinic where I studied Parkinson's disease. And then I've also worked at Vanderbilt in the summer. So I have some experience in that. Great, thank you so much, everybody. And I think that is all of our panelists. Um, so for the students and trainees who are here, I hope you will um, unmute yourself and be willing to ask questions out loud. And um, if you don't, I have questions I will ask. Um, <clears throat> so um, maybe just to get us started while people are, are getting ready for those, um, could you maybe I'll talk about how you heard about these different research experiences and, and how students can find these opportunities? That's a big question that, that comes up. Um, yeah, I can touch on this. So with regard to summer research programs, I really just did a whole Google search on summer undergraduate research programs. There is a ton out there so it can be a little overwhelming to pick and choose but also through your um, undergraduate program especially through um, at least at my school through my health professions advisory office they um, offered a list of different opportunities that's how I found out about um, the Mayo Clinic internship that I did last summer um, so keep an eye out or just like reach out to your, um, maybe your neuroscience director at your school or um, your health professions advisory office at your school. Um, and then with regards to research at your school on campus, um, really I would just recommend 
finding a lab or a professor that is doing something that looks really interesting to you and reaching out to them, emailing them and sending them your resume and just letting them know that you're really interested in joining and odds are they will be willing to take you on. Yeah, I had a very similar experience um, in that I also did a Google search for um, summer undergraduate research programs, um, as well as reached out to professors at my own school to set up summer opportunities. Um, I know people um, in the lab already that had done summer research, so then I reached out to the same PI and asked if they were taking students, if they had space, because that's something that you kind of want to do in advance um, of the summer because sometimes spots are filled and there aren't, you know, there isn't enough funding to have summer students. Um, and I think I really just found out about the opportunity to do summer research, both at my school and outside of my school um, from older students who have done the same thing. Um, so that's really how I knew that that was a thing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, for the two research experiences I was part of outside of my school, uh, I've done a summer program at University of Florida at the McKnight Brain Institute. And also this uh, coming summer, I'm doing another program at Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller University in New York City. And really each one of them like has its own way of how I got to know about it. Like uh, the one at University of Florida was similar to what Allison and Grace just said, this Google search, it's a bit, you know, it seems tedious to go page by page and database by database, just looking for opportunities that work for you, interesting fields, just the right fit for you. And I think once I have my database, I start applying to programs and, and yeah, I, I would say this is how I got to know about the one in Florida, but also another resource that I can take advantage of is asking your professors, just basically I'm interested in working over the summer and maybe my field of research doesn't really, you know, there's not a lab for the field I'm interested in on my school. So maybe I want to do something outside my school, right? And this is really what happened. Like uh, one of my professors, Professor Kate K. Mack at Swanee, she did a postdoc at Rockefeller and she recommended this program. And I think that was really, I mean, it's possible that I, I would have heard about it otherwise, but just this recommendation basically gives you this encouragement to apply and just knowing a professor who was there and who would recommend this experience. Of course, as a postdoc, it's very different from a summer intern, but I think that's also a resource that sometimes we overlook. Like if you're looking to reach out to your professor, maybe it can be to look for opportunities to work at their lab, but can also include, you know, resources outside of your school. Great, and you had put together a really extensive, you know, uh, list of opportunities with links and, and such that you shared with me, and um, sounds like you're happy to share that with other people as well if they're interested. Um, and I can add to a couple links I have on there to different databases and things. Teresa, are you aware of, of certain places where these kind of opportunities get advertised as somebody who maybe is interested in advertising a program? It's a great question. Um, I am not aware of that. Um, our program sort of exists under a much larger umbrella program. And so the sort of advertising level stuff happens by somebody not in my office. Um, a green goal. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I just also wanted to amplify, um, you know, the comments that were made by uh, Allison Safe and Grace about contacting professors directly at your university, if that's one of the things you're interested in. Um, you know, the advice to send an email, include your resume. Um, and for me personally, the thing that catches my eye is somebody who's just really enthusiastic about um, the work that I'm doing in my lab. So that if somebody says, oh, I'm, I, I hear that you do X and I'm really interested in doing X, is, is, is somebody that uh, I sort of connect with a little bit better than someone who would just write and say, I'm looking to do research, can I be in your lab? Um, and then in terms of the timing, um, 
for sure, sort of the early spring semester would be when to start sending those emails because we start figuring things out for our summer lab look, what that's going to look like in probably, you know, February and March. Um, so that's just some sort of timeline practical stuff. Yeah, and then there are these like dedicated programs where people, you know, you would apply to something, but there are also these more kind of informal relationships where you might email someone even at another university and, and I've had students do that where they say, I, you know, I live in Minnesota and I want to do something there over the summer and maybe they can volunteer or whatever. Um, and so it's, it's always, and students have this question a lot, like how do I contact someone? It's always appropriate to email a professor about their research. We, we love when people are interested in what we're doing. So um, don't hold back from, from doing that. You will make our day, right, to, to hear from you. So great. <clears throat> I don't see any hands raised or questions right now. So I will keep going with my list of questions. Um, for these sort of dedicated programs, what would an application look like? Did some of you have to apply to a program and what did you have to turn in and what was some of that timeline? We heard a little bit about maybe February, March is about when those things are happening, but can you guys share a little more about that? Yeah, so um, the internship I did last summer, um, where I applied to multiple internships that year. And I kind of started my application process in December to early January. And most of the applications that I did were due in January, some in February. Uh, it can be later or earlier, but I would suggest um, you know, like looking into programs at least before January of that summer that you want to do it. And then um, the application process for that I found for most of the internships I applied to was um, pretty extensive, consisting of at least one letter of recommendation, uh, usually two letters of recommendation. Um, and I would recommend if you have lab experience maybe uh, previously getting um, a mentor to write one of your letters or a professor that can really speak on your behalf or one of your academic advisors, um, somebody from your college rather than high school, I think is beneficial. Um, and then also um, there's usually an essay or multiple essays that you have to complete. Um, for example, the essay I had to complete was just about my career path and what this internship would do for me and why was I passionate about it. So if you can really explain your passion for it and why the specific internship is meaningful for you, that's pretty key. Um, and then also most internships, um, I know one of the questions on the sheet was like asking about GPA or if it, if they care more about prior experience versus GPA. And I found that most internships have a GPA cutoff of like 3.3 or 3.5, something around there. Um, and I, I think as long as you meet that cutoff, um, I think that the uh, experiences that you have maybe in the medical profession or in the laboratory or in your courses you've taken are um, very important in the selection process. Yeah, I also had um, to prepare essays, um, submit transcripts, um, letters of recommendation, um, so I agree with everything that Grace said. I don't think any of the programs like that I applied to specifically had a GPA cutoffs, um, but I, I'm sure that they do look at your grades and what classes that you're taking um, no matter what. Um, I will say if you don't have research experience, that's not necessarily something that's going to bar you from getting into an external program. Um, I think, as Anna said, it's, it's really um, important for you to show interest and Teresa said this as well um it's honestly probably the number one thing um it's it's why you 
need to go to that program to further your career. Um, and I know that a lot of the um, admissions um, committee for the programs that are, I was on were really interested in taking students who specifically mentioned that they are interested in doing a PhD after college. Um, and that was one of the things that they were excited about when they read an application because they wanted to provide that experience for people to help them, you know, figure out whether that's what they want to do or further their um, training. So I think mentioning that you're, you know, wanting experience in order to, um, you know, work on your journey towards a PhD is really important. Um, I think another thing um, within your essays is mentioning um, if it is this type of program where you are kind of matched into a lab it's really helpful to mention which labs um, that you're interested in, um, because I was also told by the program that I wound up being in that um, a lot of their admissions process was based on matching student interest to specific PIs and labs um, in, in the program. So the PIs who participate in that program every summer, it's really good to identify them and then say in your personal statements um, which PIs you're interested in, why, and make sure that your research interests actually align with theirs. Um, that would be a really great um, indicator of your fit for the program. Yeah, just uh, going off of what Allison just said, like in, in case for those who do not have like previous uh, research experience, there's no reason no reason to be concerned or worried because if you do not have a research experience so it will be important to highlight your interest right what kind of research questions you're interested in what kind of fields even what kind of techniques some programs i applied to will ask you what kind of experimental techniques that we'd be interested in studying so that's an example of some questions that could be on the application but also a, another thing if you do have research experience it's it's important to be able to concisely and expressively reiterate or talk about the kind of work that you have done, right? What was the purpose? What would be objective? What were the findings in a very concise manner, as well as your involvement, right? What was the extent of your involvement in this research project or lab? This is also important. And it will be even better if you can build a narrative using these different experiences, right? Build something that is more than the sum of its parts, if that's if that makes sense, basically some journey or trajectory. I did this this summer and what I've done over the semester kind of connected with uh, what I've done before. And uh, yeah, just like uh, what Grace said, uh, some of the more competitive programs, you'll ask for an even higher number of recommendation letters. So I think most of the ones I applied to would, would, would vary between like two or three letters, sometimes even four. But the important thing is to diversify these letters to be coming from different sources and and basically showing different aspects and perspectives like a research mentor maybe a neuroscience professor professor a biology professor so they should be as diverse as possible uh, and and yeah i think some programs do have i think at least the the one the snip program the one i got into at the university of florida it had an interview component to it so you'll need to pass an interview, usually with the selection committee that is running the program. So that's also another, I think that's a very key component because they have a large number of qualified applicants, but they want to filter or not filter, but basically give this number to a smaller number that can actually be accepted, right? So an interview is really important. And I would say it's, yeah, it's not just about your application. It's about, are you the same person, right? Is this application? reflecting this person now having this interview so that's also a key component and I, I think overall just one overall thing about the application it needs to be consistent and basically showing who you are as a researcher or as someone interested in research so it should be coherent consistent and you know following a trajectory or telling a narrative so I love that comment about creating a narrative. I think that's a, a really great way to think about it. Um, and, you know, I'll just really echo what was said, and at least speaking for our program, our goal is really to find students that want to go into a PhD program um, and who maybe have not had an opportunity to do an extensive research, um, have an extensive research experience in their home university for whatever reason. So, so for sure, 
prior experience in a research lab is not a prerequisite because that's that's what we want to provide. We want to provide that opportunity. Um, uh, and I think for the letters, um, you know, if you have even one letter from somebody who knows you very well and can write specifically about your strengths and your enthusiasm, um, that will carry a lot of weight. And you can even communicate with your letter writer uh, about things like your interest in going to graduate school or why you want to do the summer program so that your letter writer can potentially echo that in their letter. That's part of this making a coherent narrative that your letters of recommendation you know, align with what you say in your essays. And then from a program standpoint, we see, oh, this is an individual who really, you know, wants this um, experience and it's all sort of coherent. Um, and then just one more sort of practical thing, you wanna make sure you give your letter writers um, plenty of time to get those letters in because um, they're often writing, you know, sometimes 10 or 20 letters and they all have about the same due date. So just try to give them as much time as you can. And to that point too, like giving them some information about the specific program you're applying to, because um, as we've kind of heard, they can be different, right? Some programs are for students who don't have experience. Other programs seem to kind of want students who have who already have have some research experience. And so it's helpful for us to be able to say like why this program would benefit you and how that fits with your who you are. So um, all really great advice. Um, could some of you talk about maybe the stipends you received or other benefits you received or, or come maybe, Teresa, what kind of, uh, what do students receive when they do your program? There's always questions about that. Is this a non-paid internship or, you know, how am I going to go move to a different city for the summer and be able to um, actually do this? Yeah, I think um, this varies a lot between programs. Um, I think for the most part, at least for the ones that I applied to in my experience, I'll provide a stipend. Um, depending on um, the program, you can also receive other benefits like um, housing and food. Um, I know for my program, I got a pretty generous stipend and was allowed to um, be housed on campus completely free of charge and three meals a day, seven days a week. So I think that was the most, um, I guess, benefits that I could find in a program. Um, some other programs are going to have you pay, you know, for housing, find somewhere in a city to live or um, subsidized housing, um, or, you know, you'll have to get your own groceries and cook and things like that. So there's a lot of variability as to what other benefits you receive, but I'm pretty sure that most um, will actually offer a stipend um, if they're a, you know, summer undergraduate research uh, funded program. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really, really big consideration when you're choosing between programs, maybe if you got multiple offers or when you're actually applying, um, you do want to consider what other benefits they're offering you, um, because I really didn't have to spend a dime the entire summer if I didn't want to. And that entire stipend went towards, you know, my education in other ways, um, because I didn't have to pay for housing or food. Um, yeah, so I would definitely consider that because it, it does make a big difference and there are definitely varying degrees to which programs are offering you additional benefits besides, um, you know, just your stipend. Uh, yeah, just to follow that, I think, yeah, most of the programs I've heard about, they're mostly paid programs. There are some unpaid and you can either apply for like institutional funding from your own school or even some other programs that they might have at their school. But from my experience, I, I think your preference should be geared more towards, because in essence, you're, you're getting trained, you're getting experience, but also you work, right? You help the lab and, and, and getting a stipend it talks, it talks a little bit more to this kind of professional side of life, right? Whether you want to go into medical school or graduate school. And I think another very important consideration, I mean, you're just talking about research field. So if this program does research in your field of interest, but also in addition to stipend and whether it covers housing and food location, because so I think location is really important when thinking about this. For example, I've done this program at Gainesville, Florida, and the one I'm doing this summer is in New York City, Manhattan. So you want to, you know, see how, you know, basically cost of living would compare in these two and whether the stipend would basically make your summer, you know, not better off, but just more feasible for you financially to do this program over the summer. So location is also a pretty good point to consider. 
and overall just knowing in advance what are the things that are covered and what are the things that are not covered and sometimes there'll be a few extra things like excursions outings transportation sometimes can be covered for you like within the vicinity of like for example new york city or campus transportation whatever so just to be aware of what is covered and what is not so um yeah going off of what safe said uh location really is a big thing to consider um for my program for example i was in jacksonville florida which is a very spread out city and while i got a six thousand dollar stipend um they had um housing options uh, for us to, that they just gave us, it, it cost us half of our stipend. So we didn't get free housing. Um, we didn't get any food. And then also where we lived was like a 20 minute drive to the research center. And so if you didn't have a car, you had to coordinate with other people in your program who had a car that you could carpool and that was kind of tricky because everybody had different everybody in different labs has different schedules so some people would want to go earlier and leave earlier some people wanted to leave at like 6 p.m versus 3 p.m so the transportation also at least for me was tricky because I didn't have a car and kind of had to rely on other people to carpool unless I wanted to spend hundreds of dollars on Ubers for the summer. So that is a big thing to consider. Yeah, our program, I can just talk about the, the program at UC. Um, our, the, our stipend is $4,000 for the summer. Um, we do cover the cost of housing within university dorms, um, but we do not provide, we do not cover meals. Um, we also provide um, uh, up to $500 that is available to the student in the year following the, the in the following the year in which they were in the program um, to offset costs to attend a meeting. Um, if they have the opportunity to present results from their summer project. So that's what it looks like at Cincinnati. That's a great benefit. Uh, I've never heard of that in a, one of these programs before. So that's very cool. Um, could you all maybe next talk about what is the day-to-day -day like for a student doing summer undergraduate research? What is that, you know, what do you do every day? Um, what's the time commitment like? Um, what were you doing? Yeah, yeah, so in, oh, sorry, say, um, in my lab, uh, it's basically a full time job. Um, I think that's how most summer research programs are. Um, but it was very, um, the schedule was very flexible. And I, I worked directly under, um, not under the PI, but I had a postdoc fellow who was my mentor uh, who I was working on the my project with and he didn't really care what time I came in or what time I left as long as I got what I needed to get done that day and so essentially what I was doing each summer was I a typical day for me looked like so on Monday Wednesday Friday I was running experiments and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I was essentially analyzing my results for these exper uh, experiments um, because I could only do them. Uh, the software I was using took two days to run the um, program. So that's kind of what my days looked like. And some days um, I would finish my data analysis by lunchtime and could go home. Um, some days I was there till 6 p.m. or later working. So it really just depends on how, how quickly you work um, or what type of project you're doing because 
I also know some projects are more hands-on than others and require um, larger time commitment in general. Yeah, I think just like what Grace said, like I think it depends on your PI, on your lab, uh, the research setting in general. Some uh, PIs are more like hands-on, some of them are more like will let you do more independent kind of work. Uh, I think uh, for, for me, I think like as a timeline, at the beginning of every summer experience, there's this period of just feeling slightly lost. You're trying to basically get acquainted with the routine of the lab, know maybe shadow a postdoc or a PhD student to learn a technique, uh, attend journal clubs, just maybe familiarize yourself with the field. But then it gets more oriented, right? Then you kind of know what you're doing. You get better at some things. You get assigned maybe an independent project. So a typical week for me, like at the, the first half of the program, would consist mainly of shadowing a postdoc, learning uh, techniques that will be relevant to the questions that we'll be trying to answer later in the program. Meeting with my, with my, BI, with my PI, he was more like a big picture kind of PI. Like we would talk about, you know, big questions, themes, uh, how we might try to tackle these questions. But the more technical stuff, this is what I learned mainly from my postdoc. And then uh, I think uh, also another uh, highlight of every week was attending uh, journal clubs. And I was part of two labs that were working in a like a joint project. So I had the chance to actually, you know, mingle with people from two labs. So journal clubs can really be a, such a good tool just becoming of this weekly and daily routine of a lab. And I, I would always try once I, you know, I have my schedule set and I <clears throat> have my work done. I try always to connect with people at the lab in a, you know, more deeper level, just to understand their goals, their experiences, and maybe their frustrations sometimes, because this could be a career for many people at some point. So it's important to be aware of what kind of life would a graduate student have or would somebody in this biomedical slash neuroscience research field would have. And yeah, we would have lunch together. We, would, I think, uh, like Grace said, in, in my case, it was not very strict. Like I could come whenever and leave whenever. And uh, for some programs, you can you don't have to come on weekends. That's just something like extra or bonus if you really want to do something and need some more extra time. But I think overall it varies. But it it is one common experience is that it's often an independent experience. It's like your gateway towards this professional side of life, I think. Yeah, I think it's very lab dependent. Um, I was pretty much in the lab from nine to five, um, sometimes later, sometimes earlier, just depending on experiments. Um, but I know other people in my program were working late nights, weekends. It, it, it really seems to depend what like your PI is expecting of you. Um, but I think yeah, it also just depends on like what project you're doing. Like if you're working with animals, you might need to work at certain times. Um, if you're doing more computational work, I know people that were on their computer all day, so they're able to just like sit outside in the sun and work um, and, and kind of make their own schedule, do things at night if they wanted to. Um, so that really, you know, is dependent on like what types of projects you're doing. Um, and another feature of my program um, that kind of, I guess, shaped how my weeks went. Um, we had a preliminary talk that was to be given the end of the second week. Um, and so our whole first week was like getting into the lab, reading literature, figuring out what we were gonna do as like a mini project, uh, working with postdocs and graduate students, and then giving a talk um, at the end of the second week. And then we dove into collecting data. Um, and then at the end of the 10 week program, we had a final talk to talk about, you know, the entire summer, the data we collected. Um, so it was kind of structured around this like to talk um, structure. And some other things, I mean, I was um, on Long Island at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory um, for this summer program. So we had a lot of like outdoor activities, um, the, you know, students, it, within the program with me um, we're all really close and we got to know each other really well and we went kayaking and did a lot of like summer um, nature activities which was really really fun the program also had um, given us tickets to a broadway show 
um, and things like that. So there were a lot of like other activities that we were able to do. Um, Cold Spring Harbor also has a volleyball league in the summer, um, a beach volleyball league. So a lot of us joined that. Um, so after lab, 5 p.m., we'd all go down and play like in tournaments and volleyball. Um, so I guess like throughout the week, there were kind of other activities that we were able to do, um, especially on the weekends um, that were really fun. And, and we definitely bonded a lot as a group. So it's, it's a balance of research and, um, you know, summertime, depending on what program you're in and what lab you're in. Um, so it's definitely very variable uh, by program and lab, but I would um, try to balance your time as much as possible. Um, because you're not there to complete a thesis in eight to 10 weeks. Um, you're there to learn um, what it's like to work in a lab full time and to learn new techniques and new approaches to science and get that experience. Um, but you're also allowed to have fun and enjoy the, the process, so. Yeah. I'll just add one more thing you might wanna consider. Um, we have as part of our program, um, weekly seminars that are directed towards professional development type um, topics, so workshops on uh, how to establish a LinkedIn profile and how to utilize social media to better understand your science or to sort of further your understand engagement with science, um, tips on how to present a poster. Um, so, you know, that's just a, and those are just typically one hour weekly workshops that, you know, sort of fall within this broader, you know, main focus of just doing full-time research. But I love the idea of, you know, really focusing on the idea that you're getting an understanding of what a full-time research job looks like without the expectation of, you know, completing a thesis project in eight to 10 weeks, um, but that you're also supposed to be, you know, enjoying life and having fun and playing volleyball. So. Yeah, I agree. That's great advice. And um, it's also my understanding a lot of programs have what you're talking about, Teresa, where there are these professional development type activities. And I think those are worth looking for and seeing if that's something, you know, if you do have a choice between programs to think about, um, can you get a program that gives you those opportunities? You know, long, long ago, I participated in a summer research program. Um, and having those opportunities was really important to me coming from a liberal arts school where we didn't have a grad school. Or a medical school, you know, being able to see and hear about all these things from postdocs and PhD students, you know, was important to me because I didn't have those opportunities at my home institution. And I was able to talk about those things when I applied to grad school and say, hey, I know what I'm getting into because I've done this program that taught me all these things. Um, so I think that's really important that, um, if you can get those opportunities. Um, so one of the questions we also had was about what kind of data can you expect to collect? And you sort of touched on this, so I don't know if people want to elaborate a little bit more. Um, were you able to complete a, a full project? Would students be able to expect to collect meaningful data in that amount of time? Um, or is it more just sort of this seeing what it's like kind of experience? Um, I'm curious what you guys found and if you maybe presented anywhere or Teresa, you mentioned students have a stipend to go present somewhere, is that common? Yeah, it, I think it depends um, what techniques you're doing. Um, and also, um, you know, if you're working on someone else's project or whether you're kind of doing your own independent work. Um, because if you're, you know, I was doing behavior in mice and sometimes things go wrong and things are, you know, a lot, there's a lot of troubleshooting. There's a lot of um, things that can actually delay experiments. Um, and so, I wouldn't say that I completed a full project, but I contributed, you know, meaningfully to the lab. Um, and I think towards the end, when you're like wrapping up data, and if you have to write some sort of report or give a talk, kind of what you did does become a mini project, um, even if it's not what you thought you were going to do or finish. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, if you're working on a project that a postdoc has already started, and you're contributing data, then maybe you might end up presenting with them somewhere. Um, but I personally did not have enough time to complete a full project that wound up, you know, becoming a poster or a manuscript. Um, but I think it's definitely possible to get on a poster or a manuscript if you're working um, with someone that's already established in the lab. 
Yeah, I, I think yeah, there is really a lot of variations, like uh, what Allison said, depending on the project and depending on the extent or how long, like how much work has already been done, or if you're like basically continuing work of some other project. But I think it is like when, when it comes to what kind of data you can collect and what you can do with it, it really comes down to the open and like uh, the, the very important conversation that you'll have with your PI or supervisor at the beginning of the experience. Basically, what are your expectations of this summer? What are you looking for? Maybe earlier in the process, you know, uh, your sophomore year summer, maybe you're looking more to get acquainted with a field, get more research experience, but maybe later you're looking for graduate school applications. So maybe you wanna get publications, maybe you're interested in, you know, getting, getting involved in something that is more like a short-term plan to be published. So I think uh, I, for example, I worked on a, a TBI a project, traumatic brain injury over the summer. And uh, there was already some work, like some ground that was laid already. And when I was able to continue after this, it culminated in, 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 in like a set of data that was publishable. So there's always this possibility possibility depending on your objectives and expectations to get actually something published even if it's an eight to ten week summer experience right so that's that's possible and actually it's very exciting and stimulating and depending on your career goals it can motivate you to pursue other things right or maybe you know reorient your interest in another field of research uh, on the other side some pis might just be interested in you know you doing more lit search or literature search, getting familiar with a field. Uh, for example, the lab I'm at now. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good, another good example. I'm currently studying abroad in Denmark where I'm also involved uh, in a lab at the University of Copenhagen. And the question that we're trying to answer is studying sleep in ALS patients. And one thing about ALS patients, they're very rare to find. So that's a question. It's very hard to complete a project like that within a semester, right? given a lot of you know, technical complications. So yeah, you can get that, you can get this, but it's, it's really all about the conversation that you can have with your PI at the beginning and just you know, making everything clear about expectations and what everybody's looking for. So. Yeah, I completely agree with um, how much it varies with who your PI is and um, what project you're on, but I can just describe what my experience was with that. So I was um, working on an ongoing project um, alongside my mentor. So it was in kind of in the very beginnings. Um, it was basically, I was looking at uh, Lewy body aggregation in, um, Parkinson's disease type patients and we were studying the alpha synuclein aggregation rates in uh, soluble and insoluble brain fractions and so um, the uh, soluble brain fractions had already been done and my role was to work on the insoluble brain fractions and run the experiments on those. And I completed uh, all my experience for the insoluble brain fractions, but, um, and we did see some results at the end, but it wasn't like enough to write a paper on because it was still in the preliminary stages and it was just like, an early study to kind of guide wh where our next um, research question would go. So my mentor, he's still working on that project and um, updating me and everything. But yeah, I um, made a poster on it, but and like presented it at the end of my program to the faculty in my program, but. Um, no paper or anything has come from it yet. I think it'll be, well, first my mentor is um, trying to get funding, which is also an issue that kind of takes a while and he's been rejected multiple times. So he's still trying to get funding to complete this project. But 
maybe in the next year or two, there will be some significant results. Great, thanks for sharing those experiences. Um, we have about five minutes left. I'm, I'm wondering if um, you guys would be willing to talk about what you thought was the most meaningful or valuable thing that you got from doing summer research. Um, and hopefully we'll hear some different, different ideas. Yeah, I think I'll just reiterate what I said about learning what it's like to do full-time research. Um, I was also at a liberal arts college, um, so my lab at my home institution was just undergrads and my PI. Um, I had absolutely no idea what the day-to-day -day life of a PhD student or a postdoc was. Um, you know, my professors were also half teaching, half doing research, um, so they, you know, I, I wasn't really seeing what, you know, the life of, P of a PI was like either. Um, so it really gave me the opportunity to, you know, do a nine to five research job, get more acquainted with academia in general. Um, I didn't really have any idea what was going on um, outside of my own school. And I, I think it was really, really valuable to work aside PhD students and see what their day-to-day -day life was. And so I guess the biggest takeaway was, do I wanna continue doing this? Do I want to pursue a PhD? Um, and familiarizing myself with what that would be like than doing full-time research. Yeah, I, um, I think for me, that was also a big um, part of it for me, what Allison was talking about. Um, one of the most meaningful for me though was looking at where I started and where I ended in terms of just my confidence in the research setting and my competence in general and um, ability to be an independent researcher because this um, program that I did was, I had been, I had had some lab experience um, as an assistant, but this was the first time I'd ever really taken on my own project and went through the whole research pr process of like making a protocol for myself and running the experiments without my mentor, like with me every time and, you know, um, making a poster, um, being able to describe my results to people. Um, so it, took me from when I first started, I was um, super overwhelmed and felt like, you know, a sense of like imposter syndrome almost of like, oh my God, this is way too complicated for me. I don't know what I'm doing here. This is all too much. And then at the end of the program, I felt um, confident that I could go back to my home lab and you know take on a project of my own and work more independently um, and be more capable so that was really important for me yeah i think just to echo that like uh, one good thing about summer programs if you're interested in a career in research they can let you know that maybe this is something for you this is a good fit this is something that you would you know thrive at and actually like doing, or maybe it's not for you, right? Like with a degree in neuroscience, you can do so many different things. You can do science communication, you can do industry, pharmaceutical companies, you can do maybe more teaching than research in academia. You can do like a whole host of things, right? But for me, I think the main take, take home message from last summer was basically that this is something I like, and this is something that I can actually get better at with practice and dedication, I can actually improve. So it, just I think without this experience there might have been maybe some hesitation left or just like Grace said imposter syndrome or you're you're not sure if this is really the right fit for you like a career in research or graduate school so that was the main thing for me it confirmed my interest oh well, that's really great to hear Teresa do you have any information on where students from your program go or what sort of outcomes you see that you could share 
Um, great question. I, I have that data. I don't have it right in front of me. Um, and there's just a bit of a time lag because we typically um, have students in their sophomore or junior years. Um, and so they will oftentimes either, you know, not everybody applies to graduate school right away straight from their undergraduate. So either working as a technician or doing a post back program. Um, so we're still sort of a couple of years out from being able to, um, you know, see sort of where they've gone kind of metrics. Um, I was just thrilled though to hear what everybody said about what they got from their programs because that's what that that's what we hope our students have the experience of to gain confidence um, in just the, the entire research process to to gain experience about what it's like, what does a PhD student's life look like? Um, so that was just great to hear. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear you've had, the three of you have had such great experiences and I really, really appreciate um, all four of you taking the time to talk with us today and share those experiences and this important information. So um, thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation.